Welcome back to the Ketamine Startup Podcast. Uh, we're here to talk about running your own ketamine clinic and how to make that a reality. And we're going to talk today about a commonly asked question about how much do you really need to start a ketamine clinic? Uh, you know, and it's just a completely legitimate question when you're, you're starting a business venture. How much do I need to initially invest to get this going? Yeah, it might be the butt that's holding many people back right now. Because, you know, some of us may have student loans and life expenses and Teslas. And you might be thinking, can I really afford this entrepreneurial leap? So in this episode, we are going to crunch some numbers and talk about hard cash and get down into the nitty gritty of things. So, you know, starting a ketamine clinic, it's not a one size fit all as to how much money that you need. I mean, of course, there are many factors that take into account, you know, like where you are. In the United States, you know, there's certain places that are more expensive than others. Um, and so, you know, and it also depends on how much you're going to do yourself um, when you first start out. And so, you know, these things that can affect your bottom line of how much you need to start, you know, if you're going to sublet or lease a office space or are you going to buy an office building, um, will obviously change how much you initially need to invest. 100%. I mean, I think that's the big variability is geographic location. You know, if someone is in downtown Los Angeles versus some rural area in Wisconsin, um, it's going to be different because the cost of living is different. But if someone were to say, okay, what is the range? How much can I expect? And we want to be upfront with you. So I would say if I had to put a number or even a range on this, anywhere between 75000 to 150000 as a buffer for these initial costs and even for a little bit of runway uh, for like, let's say, the first six months to one year. And as Kim had mentioned, if you know, you're know you subletting space from another physician, well, that's going to definitely lower your uh, costs. But if you're like going to build out and spend... $300,000 to build out a space and then pay, you know, 20 to 30 K monthly lease because you're want to be in like the downtown prime area. Well, that's going to make things much more expensive. Or if you already have a practice of your own, you already own a building, you already have a clinic space, you already have things started out. And this is something you're adding to your existing practice. Let's say you are a, a psychiatrist and you're adding ketamine infusion therapy that's going to be very different than, let's say, uh, emergency medicine, like Sam, you know, we did not have an office. So we had to decide on whether we we're going to rent or buy, and where we we're going to be. So there's so many factors, as you can imagine. But I wanted to go back to that one thing you're talking about the runway. So some people are familiar with what a runway is, some are not. Um, how to think of a runway is the amount of money that you need uh, to run your business, run your practice without having any cash flow first coming in. Because, you know, when we first started, we did not see many patients. And if we were relying solely on the amount of money coming in to pay our bills, to cover the overhead, to pay the lease, to pay our staff, to pay for the ketamine, um, we would be out of business. But sometimes it just takes time to grow that momentum of having patients come in establishing your marketing, establishing your reputation in your medical community as a ketamine specialist. And sometimes you just need a little bit of money um, to help, you know, get you through it. And so that's why there is that range, um, that 75K to 150K is depending on how much you need to, how much money is needed to run your practice each month. The more it is, the more you're going to need for your runway. And then the other component, um, as Kim had mentioned, is like there can be initially not a great demand for you know your services. I remember when we first started back in 2018, I think I did four infusions the entire month of uh, opening. And I was like, wow, this is really slow. Um, fortunately, I was still working part-time in the emergency department, so there was that financial cushion. And so for those of you who are considering and wanting to start up a ketamine clinic, it might be really wise 
to actually just keep your job that you currently have, but maybe go part-time or per diem or, or 0.5 FTE or 0.7 FTE, whatever it is, um, knowing that I would say, you know, not expecting like a huge line of patients waiting at your door, slamming like, hey, when are you opening? When are you opening? Because that could um, not be the case. Now, we have had other students who within their first month, they were super busy and they saw a bunch of patients, like way more than we did. I was really surprised. And that might be related to kind of what's going on in the cultural zeitgeist with uh, more news articles and more scientific articles being published regarding ketamine therapy. But I say, you know, expect, uh, plan for the worst and expect the best. So keeping that in mind, you may want to keep that initial job or one of your clinical jobs, but also at the same time, reduce the number of hours so you can have energy and time to devote in starting up the new business. So then like another question that comes up, you know, like, you know, well, when will I see my money? When will I see the return on my investment? And it, again, it just depends on, uh, you know, your reputation in the community for the referrals. Uh, but in some places, referrals from other medical providers are not going to be your main source of patients. You know, it may be um, patients looking for you, uh, patients that are searching online, searching for you, um, searching for your services, and how much or how well, how much money or in time you put into being findable, searchable online uh, will contribute to when you'll see your money be returned um, on investment or when you're starting to have money or a consistent uh, patient base. And then at that time, when you find that consistent patient base, when you know your own personal financial numbers to where, okay, my ketamine clinic can now support um, all the things that I want to have financially supported in my life, then you can consider transitioning out. It was not a, you know, overnight thing for us to leave our really solid, decent, uh, salaried hospital positions. I mean, it, I was continuing to work um, for several years. And I mean, and then we all, I mean, to be honest, we had the pandemic helped shake things up incredibly to get us to relook at the trajectory of our business and our practice. Yeah, totally. The pandemic did throw us a little bit of a curveball. But because we kept our overhead really low at the clinic, um, it was very sustainable. And I do want to recap on some of the costs. So probably the big thing will be the lease. So the office space. Um, number two is staff. So whether you're hiring nurses or medical assistants or CNAs, that's going to cost money. Um, you're going to need insurances, and that includes malpractice, professional liability insurance, business insurance, workers' compensation insurance, cyber liability insurance. Um, all these other insurances that I was not aware of. And then you're going to need supplies. And when I say supplies, I'm thinking, you know, the medicines, the syringes, the pumps, the vital sign monitoring machine, the bandages, the band-aids, the gauze, all of those, you know, tiny little things that we're not necessarily aware of if you don't already own a clinic. Um, and so, yeah, I would say those are kind of the main factors. And then, of course, marketing. And marketing is variable cost. Um, I remember when we first started, like, I think I put down five grand, 10 grand to be published in a local magazine and get like a full uh, one, one page advertorial that went out to a bunch of people. So the marketing efforts um, can range. So it really depends upon, you know, how much money you put into marketing, um, the location and how you're leasing the space and then the staff. Uh, there's this old business saying like um, expenses walks on two legs. So meaning probably your biggest cost is human capital. So the people you hire. And so that might look like where you actually wear a lot of hats. And so that's what I did is I wore a lot of hats. I was the secretary. I was the janitor. I was the office runner. Uh, I, I did. I was the uh, office manager. And so just like wearing all of these hats, the more hats you wear, the less your cost, but then at the same time, it is costing you time-wise, maybe not financially, but it does cost time-wise. But going, just, uh, what do you call it? The Touching back on our other episode about archetypes, this is the manager coming out in me. Like, I think it's really good to start off wearing a lot of hats because um, then you know how to best outsource something to somebody else. You know, if you know your process 
in and out from like how the patient should be greeted, what they need to do, what they need to know once they walk in through that door to all the way when they leave or if they need it, they have questions and you know, you answer this, you do all of those things, you know, then how to train, um, the staff that's going to do that for you or how you are going to train, um, you know, another physician that can start assisting you or, you know, so you can step out of the clinic and have another um, specialist be there instead of you. And then you can go from operator to owner. Um, but you can't successfully do that or know how that's going unless you've done it yourself. Like, I think that's why we've done so well from um, about from hiring and then how to have a consistent patient experience is because we did every single aspect. Same thing for me going with marketing. You know exactly what you want, how you want it to be, how you want to be presented, um, what things you say, how you say things uh, about the ketamine experience, about ketamine treatments. Um, you can outsource that to somebody, but if you don't really understand how that all works, you don't know if they're actually you're actually getting your bang for your buck or that they're actually helping you. And so even though it's such a pain wearing all those hats at first, I think it's part of the growth. I think it's part of the process. But more importantly, it does keep costs down at the beginning. Therefore, you can have be part of that lower end of that uh, spectrum of um, lower end of the range for your initial investment. And now a quick word for our aspiring ketamine clinic founders out there. If you've tuned into our episode today, chances are you're curious about the ins and outs of starting up a ketamine clinic. It's an exciting field, but let's face it, the journey from idea to actually opening day can be quite daunting. That's why we've created something special for you. Think of it as your personal roadmap, a free downloadable checklist that lays out the essential steps you need to consider when starting up your own ketamine clinic. This checklist is designed to help you avoid common pitfalls and launch your trajectory to success. So how can you get your hands on this checklist? Simple. Just visit www.ketaminestartup.com forward slash checklist and grab your free copy today. We've made it easy and accessible because we believe in supporting our community with valuable resources. Ketaminestartup.com forward slash checklist. All right, let's get back to our discussion. Stay tuned and don't forget to download your free checklist during or after the podcast. So if you're on the fence about all of this, you might want to ask yourself, Will I regret not jumping into this space when you're, let's say, on your deathbed, 85, 95 years old, God uh, willing? And then think about like, well, if I don't open one up and someone else were to open one up, how would that make me feel? And I think that was one of the biggest drivers for me is like, man, what if um, Dr. Smith down the street opens up a clinic and I'm going to look at their office and think, man, I wish I would have taken that leap. And I don't want you to have that regret at the end of your life. So really keep kind of, you know, the big picture in mind. And it's definitely a calculated risk. And, you know, for some people, like, they don't feel comfortable with that risk. And they just prefer having a stable paycheck, uh, regular hours. Um, so entrepreneurship and opening up, opening up a clinic just may not be your jam. And that's totally cool. Like, again, we had talked about in the first podcast, knowing yourself and knowing who you are can be really comforting. Because if you're like, you know, I don't like risk and I'm afraid and I don't want to do it. Like, it may just not be for you because there is a bit of risk when you start up something new. I think the uh, small business administration, they say one only one out of five businesses, this is overall like restaurants, retail, et cetera, will make it in five years. So there's definitely a risk when someone is starting up a clinic. Um, but I think the real key for us is keeping overhead very low, especially when you're first starting. I think that can play a really important role, wearing a ton of hats and all of that will make it still risky, but reducing the risk, making it a calculated risk. Because it's it goes both ways, you know, testing out if, um, you know, that that risk is there's the risk you may find that, hey, I, I can do this. I do it pretty well, but I don't want to do it anymore. You know, for whatever reason, you realize this isn't for me. Um, and having a lower investment makes the the pain of stepping away yet again from something be a little bit less because sometimes you just, you know, you just don't know until you're in it, um, you know, as much as, you know, you 
ask people that open ketamine clinics or go to conferences or, you know, maybe even get a treatment yourself um, because you have a diagnosis and you get a sense of how it goes and all of that. And you're like, hey, I could do this. Um, well, you know, how many times have you said, oh, I can do this and you tried it and you go, yeah, I, re I now know why I don't do this for a living. Um, sometimes you don't know until you do it. And again, just that running a place with a low overhead um, makes this sting just a little bit less. And thankfully and luckily for us, we still like it. We, we find the joy of taking care of this patient population with this form of therapy and being in this space that is ever growing is something we find very fulfilling in an, uh, inside the clinic and outside of it. But for some, it won't. And so, you know, it goes back to knowing who you are and keeping it lean, a lean business practice. And, um, you know, I'd say I wouldn't want to live in regret. So jumping into that what if, you know, just going back to what you're saying, Sam, of like, you know, oh, man, it would I would be heartbroken if we had held back and then found out like another person opened up down the street. Um, I'd rather take that chance and say, ah, well, I did it and now I know versus you know, at 80, 100, being like, oh man, I wonder what life would have been if we had done it. Yeah, we really don't want you to let the what ifs dictate your future. And please know that if we can make the leap, so can you. So please join us next time for more insights on sharing and running your own ketamine clinic. Uh, please hit subscribe, share with a friend. And remember, it's not just a clinic, it's actually a new beginning. So until next time, we will see you or hear from you uh, soon. And as usual, if you can, this is, you know, one of our earlier podcasts. So please uh, give us a five star rating, uh, whether you're listening to it on Apple or Spotify, and that'll really help get the outreach to uh, the community. Thank you again and take care.